Um, can I just get a show of hands to get an idea of how many people, I, every, I know everyone's already heard about web accessibility, um, but how many people would consider them to be consider themselves to be pretty well versed with web accessibility? Anyone just getting started? Yeah, with implementation or, yeah? Okay, all right. So um, because we have uh, a variety of different um, skill sets and, and understanding of web accessibility, I'm gonna bring us um, all to the same basic understanding of what web accessibility is, what's going on um, in the news. As, as Melanie mentioned, there was uh, a recent lawsuit, I believe it, in November, filed against um, Penn State University. Um, so we're also going to talk about who is affected um, by web accessibility, and then what are some of the different things that we can implement to make sure that our websites are accessible. And while I can't teach it in one setting all of the different, you know, the guidelines, you see you shaking your heads, all of the, di all of the different checkpoints um, and standards required to make a site um, accessible, I can give you some insight into some very common things to look out for. Okay? And um, as Jasmine said earlier, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Yes, on. yes. Please interrupt. Okay, so what is web accessibility? And quite simply, it is being able to make our websites accessible to those people with disabilities. We should understand that people with disabilities have special needs, and many times they're using assistive devices. And I'll go through some of those assistive devices in some following slides. And there are certain things that we need to make sure we're doing on our websites so that we are assistive device friendly. And the disabilities that we're talking about may include visual impairment, hearing impairment, cognitive or uh, mental impairment, and um, physical. So a little bit about what's going on. Um, as we all know, uh, we rely on the web more and more today to take care of some daily activities. We are planning our vacations and booking our flights and booking reservations to the doctor's office and taking care of things with the, is it the Motor Vehicles Association out here in Maryland? It's the Motor Vehicles Association, not Department of Motor Vehicles, whatever it is. But there are a lot of things we buy online. There are a lot of things that we do today um, that we're very dependent on the web for. And the challenge arises when we start pushing all of this information on the web and, and slowly but surely taking it away from other sources. So we're no longer, you know, um, sending paper statements, everything's online. Um, we're no longer making certain types or sources of information available any other way than the web. And so that becomes a little problematic if our websites can't be used with assistive devices or not all of the information can be um, viewed by people with disabilities. And so what we've seen, I'm sure everyone is, well, okay, maybe assumption, let me back up. Um, there was a landmark lawsuit uh, that was filed in 2006 against the National Federation for the Blind um, against Target. So the NFB claimed that Target had information on their site that was available to sighted users, but not available to people with vision impairment. And Target was not interested in um, making the minimum uh, changes required to make their website usable by some of these assistive devices. Um, so what happened was um, the judgment was in favor for, for Target and it ended in a $6 million lawsuit. In addition to that, Target needed to work with the National Federation for the Blind to make sure that their site became accessible. And that was uh, at an additional cost. Um, 
Oh, no, no. Did I say that? Oh. No, no. In favor of, I probably, maybe I did say that. In favor of the National Federation for the Blind, so I'm sorry. Um, there was also a case with um, a group of private blind citizens in Florida who filed suit against Southwest Airlines for the same sort of thing, not having the information on their website accessible to them with, by using their assistive devices. And unfortunately, with this case, it was thrown out due to a technicality, but that doesn't mean it didn't have any merit. So let me talk a little bit about some of the things that are a little closer to home, some of the stuff that's happened in higher ed. Um, for instance, we already referenced Penn State University. Um, one of the things that resonated with me when I was reading about this case was the spokesperson for the National Federation for the Blind said that the NFB hoped that this would be a wake-up call for universities across the country. And the reason why that resonated with me is, you know, a lot of my clients are in higher ed. Um, and I know that the NFB is a pretty litigious group. Um, you know, they are protecting the rights of uh, people with vision impairment. Um, and Penn State University, uh, <coughs> they uh, had a a lawsuit filed because um, they had a multitude of technologies that were not accessible. So it wasn't just actually the website. Um, there was their library, their course management system, um, I, I believe their uh, course catalog. Um, and uh, I think that there was just sort of a prevalent, ongoing um, lack of interest in making or lack of effort in making their technologies accessible. Um, in California, there's a group of law schools, and, and this is kind of interesting, that uh, were filed suit against, and this was all from the NFB, mind you, um, not because their site wasn't accessible, but because they were requiring students to apply for admission on another site that was not accessible. So they, the, the suit was against them, but not for their own website, but because they required students to apply um, on another website that was not accessible. Um, and that was in 2009. Uh, Penn State, I believe, was just last November. Arizona State University was also in 2009, and you might have heard about this. Uh, they were, along with other schools, uh, were planning to distribute their textbooks using Kindle. Um, if you don't know what Kindle is, it's an electronic reader. Um, you, can, you can buy electronic books on it. And here's the funny thing. At the time that this lawsuit occurred, the Kindle, I believe it was the Kindle DX version, um, had a built-in screen reader. So it would read the text of the textbook. But, and I think this is really funny, um, the menu system on the Kindle system itself did not have the same capability. <laughs> so, so you couldn't get to any of those textbooks to use the screen reader to, to read the books. So um, anyway, what happened with that is Arizona State University, needless to say, decided not to distribute Kindle um, to the students uh, as f for the required textbooks. Um, and um, the Kindle, the latest edition, is supposed to be fully accessible in their menu system. Um, it should now have the, uh, the screen reader available. OK, some good, mo any questions so far? Just a quick question yes. about <clears throat> the definition of who's um, impaired in one way or another. Like, a, I don't know if the law has branched out. It, you know, like people that maybe don't know Um, people who don't know how to use... People that aren't really computer literate, is that part of... Not to my knowledge. Um, if someone suffers from a cognitive or mental impairment, uh, that constitutes okay. being uh, disabled. And I'll actually go through some of that in some, in some, fo um, some slides following. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, some accessibility milestones. Um, uh, just a few months ago, we passed the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act 
of 2010. If you're familiar with this, what it does is it requires any video that has captions has to also have captions on the web. So that's nice. It would have been nicer if they required all video on the web to have captions. Um, but I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, and something that's gotten a lot of publicity is the Department of Justice considering um, extending the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, to include uh, the web. And so let me go through and talk about what the Americans with Disabilities Act is. So it's a civil rights act and it protects people's people, protects people um, with disabilities from being discriminated against. And there's a little bit of a misnomer. Sometimes you'll hear people say, I need my site to be ADA compliant. And there isn't really an ADA compliant website because there is no specific reference to web properties in ADA. But what people will argue is the term public accommodation. So people will argue that the web is a place of public accommodation. And so that's where it's a little bit gray. Now what does protect, what is a real regulation is Section 508. And Section 508 requires that all electronic communications be accessible if you're um, employed by the federal government, if you're working with the federal government, or receiving aid from the federal government. Um, and this includes any private sites that are receiving federal aid. Uh, the good news is that there are also many uh, states that are adopting the regulations of Section 508. So, for instance, it's mandatory in Maryland, it's mandatory in California, I know it's mandatory in New York. And I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics on Section 508 in a couple of slides. Another thing that we also need to consider is there's the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in Section 504. Um, while there are definitely variations between the two, one is an Education Act, the other is a Civil Rights Act, um, both of them protect students who are receiving federal aid from being discriminated. And they're, uh, t they're students who um, require uh, special education needs. So if you're unsure whether or not um, your state is ob obligated to follow 508s, check with your admi administration, um, your state board or legal attorney. <laughs> um, but the whole reason why I'm sharing these stories with you is because there seems to be a very steady progression to uh, regulating the web for accessibility. We're seeing the lawsuits, we're seeing the increasing use of um, uh, the web for day-to-day -day activities, and it's, it's just becoming um, a bigger and bigger concern. So I hope this is gonna answer your question. We're gonna talk about who's affected and how. Uh, remember I mentioned visual, physical, hearing, and cognitive or mental impairment. So, for instance, um, with people with vision impairment, they may be blind or they may have um, some sort of color blindness. They have, their accessibilities, I mean, I'm sorry, their accessibility barriers are the monitor and the mouse. And to get over that, they use different things like these, uh, these braille readers, they have over the screen magnifiers that really enlarge things. And then they also have online magnifiers where they really, really zoom into the text. And it's really important to, to keep this mental picture um, because you know when you design things, it'll be important that your text is relative in size so that they are able to zoom in really close. It's also important to know that they're they're zooming in really close, so they may not see some of the content that you've laid out, 
or some of the content that, you, that you've created may sort of um, overlap each other in your layout. Now they use keyboard shortcuts to get around. Um, and some of them also use voice recognition software. Now for the hearing impaired, and they may have um, complete or, or partial speech impairment, their accessibilities are multimedia, audio, video. So we need to make sure that our videos are captioned if we truly want them to be accessible um, to people who are hearing impaired. Audio files, they need to have transcripts. And if for some reason you cannot caption your video, at least try to provide a transcript with it. Otherwise, the content is just not accessible by anyone. Um, the good news is that I believe Google ha is, has a, a new beta um, transcriber. Have you seen it? Yes. Um, but there's also, is it, is it pretty it's, bad? It's harsh. <laughs> it's harsh, yeah. It's, it's new. But it's a step in the right direction, right? It's a step in the right direction. So Google's trying to come up with this um, new uh, tra video transcriber. Um, but there's also something called Magpie, and that will help you um, caption your videos, and it's free. OK. So there's also physical um, impairment. And again, the barriers might be use, being able to use a mouse or being able to use a keyboard. Some of them have mouse stick devices. Some of them have head wands. And they use these devices to control the keyboard. So it's really, really important to be able to navigate your site only using a keyboard. They're also using eye tracking software and voice recognition software. Now, for people that might have cognitive impairment, and that might be something like Down syndrome, ADD, or dyslexia, there really aren't any assistive devices. It's all about how we present the content. And you really want to think about just web best practices. You know, when we write content for the web, it needs to be in easy, digestible chunks, you know, blocks of copy. Um, and the same thing follows here for uh, people with cognitive impairments. Make the content simple and easy to read and simple and easy to use. Um, when you're trying to um, illustrate a complex um, idea, try using more video, videos, more charts, uh, more pictures. So supplementary information is, is important. So the benefits, aside from, you know, being being ethical uh, include that you'll be able to reach out to a wider audience because about 20 percent of the people in the United States have some sort of impairment and so if it's accessible to them then we have um, a broader audience that we can reach out to and then we have improved usage because we're following you know some content rules making things simpler and easier to use and um, we usually follow semantic web and that just means that the structure of your website is correct and you know it's really a win-win for everyone it's a it's a win for search engine optimization it's a win for usability for your sighted and, and non-impaired visitors and and the um, visitors who do have impairments. Um, and then, of course, if your site is accessible, we reduce the risk of litigation. And that's always a plus. And we avoid any negative brand impact. I'm sure that Penn State isn't looking too hot right now after a lawsuit and, and um, uh, that has you know, plastered them on the news as discriminating against people with disabilities. Okay, so how do we make our sites accessible? Well, I talked a little bit about Section 508, um, about the standards. Remember, they're the, the federal regulations. 
Well, they also have some very, very specific guidelines that you can follow. And I'm not going to go through those guidelines today, but I'm going to show you some very common things to look out for. Um, in addition to that, there's the international standard because Section 508 is just for the U.S. government. In addition to that, there's WCAG or WCAG or WebCAG. I've heard it pronounced several different ways by people in the industry. And this is an international standard. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. And the latest guidelines, I believe, are 2.0. And it's pretty comprehensive, and they, they share techniques in which you can um, meet uh, accessibility compliance. I think so. I think I can, yes. Was there a question or you were just dot jotting it down? Oh, okay. <laughs> so in addition to knowing, and it's section 508.gov and wcag.org. Um, uh, and I might be wrong about the last one. Um, so it's important to at least have an understanding of what those guidelines are. Now the different methods for evaluating accessibility is to use an, a usability or an accessibility expert to come in, do an assessment, look at your sites, give you an action plan, and assist you in implementing that plan. Um, there are also automated validation tools. And there are a couple free ones out there, I'll list them in some slides to come. And what they do is they scan the website um, to see if they meet certain technical checks or technical requirements. And they're really good for doing just an initial pass because they're very limited in that maybe you can only submit one page every couple of minutes or so. So they're not really effective for ongoing web accessibility initiatives. Um, and you can't do you know regular uh, maintenance or health checks with them, and they have no reporting capability. Um, but the best way to um, evaluate whether or not your site is accessible is to do some usability testing with, with the target audience, with the people who actually have disabilities. So here are some common things to check. Try just using your keyboard, and then ask yourself some of these questions. So if you started at the top, you know, you, you entered a web page and you tabbed through the web page, does it take you in a logical sequence? Or do you sort of jump around in places that don't make sense and you don't understand where you are? Ask yourself if you can access all of the links on, on the page just using your keyboard. No mouse. Can you resize the screen? If you're able to access a link and it opens a new window, do you realize that an, a new window has been opened and can you access that new window? Practice this. The last one is a good one. So we all see flyout menus and cool mega menus, but if you only use your, your keyboard, are those menus still accessible? Because sometimes they're not. So it's another thing that you really need to check out. You can also use a screen reader. So screen readers um, will actually read the content on your site. And they're very, this, the speech is very synthesized. It does not sound natural at all. It begins by um, telling you, uh, I believe, the title of, of the page, how large the page is, um, how much of the page is, is being downloaded or, or has been downloaded. Um, and then it'll start to read from left to right. 
uh, your probably your logo, your main navigation, um, and then it'll go down to maybe your left navigation and then down to your body content, which sounds fine at first, but then if you're going to another page in the same site, you do the same thing over again. And so that's why when you see those little skip navigation link links at the top, they're really important. Because instead of having to read that navigation over and over again, every time I visit a site, I can skip directly to the content. I'll cover some of the other things on this list. Um, but actually, I'm not going to try to go back, but if you could just pretend we're on the previous slide, um, you can download a free version of JAWS. JAWS is the most common screen reader that is available, and you can experience this, and I encourage you to do this. Um, Another thing that you can download is another screen reader emulator called Fangs. It's available on Firefox as an add-on, and you can experience this as well. I see some heads nodding, so I think there are some people who have um, used this. So remember I talked about having this skip to main content or skip navigation link? Because when the screen reader comes, they read WebAIM, Web Accessibility in Mind, products, services, articles, resources, community, all this stuff here, and then they'll go to the main content. And then, for instance, if I click on product, it'll do the same thing again. So it's really important to be able to jump to different parts of the page. Here is, I think, a really simple fix, but a really common problem. And ask yourself if your links make sense out of context. So if you take your links away from the rest of the context, will the site visitor understand where the link is taking them to? So if I were to use a screen reader that allowed me to just jump to links, or that I had set up to read the links first before even you know, exploring the rest of the page, because there are quite a few settings that I can um, tailor my screen reader to do. It could just go to full story, full story, full story. Click here. That doesn't make any sense if that's all the information I get. I don't know what this full story is to. I don't know what click here is to. I don't know where that's going. So it's really, really important to make sure that your links make sense out of context. So an easy solution here is you don't need the full story link. Just make the, the headlines the links. Um, and then what we have to keep in mind is it's not just about the screen readers. There are people with vision impairment. There might be a color blindness issue or a color contrast, contrast issue depending on what your link color is. So they still may not realize that this is a link because it may not seem uh, appear to be blue or, or yellow or orange or, or red or whatever it is you designed your links to be. So in addition to maybe changing the color, the best thing to really do is put an underline under there. I know sometimes the designers just don't like the underlines, but they're very, very, very functional. If you don't want to do an underline, at least bold it, but we need to provide other cues to people with impairments so that they can easily access the content as well. Um, instead of saying click here, just link the actionable item because that makes sense. Oh, take the 2011 reader sur survey, right? Okay. Um, alternative text is of helps um, people using text browsers, text-only browsers, or screen readers understand the content of an image. Um, anyone who is sort of implementing um, Section 508 or WCAG standards knows to have alternative text on the image. But the trick is, are you using effective alternative text? 
So these are instances where these uh, alternative text descriptions are appropriate. So we have a logo, Dunder Mifflin Incorp. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm an Office fan. Um, portrait of Michael Scott. What we want to do is we want the alternative text to um, encompass what the what the content has, not what it sort of looks and feels like, but the purpose it serves. So here's another good example. I have a chart here. And the alternative text should typically be short. So instead of saying, I don't know, image of a gasoline chart, it's, you know, uh, what we pay for in a gallon of regular gas chart. And then if you want to give them more details in a long description, you can give the details of what this image is trying to communicate. So if the image is trying to communicate something, make sure that it, that is in your alternative text. If it has no purpose but to be decorative, then what we want to do is use what we call a null attribute. Fill out the alt text. Do not leave it empty. Use double quotations because if it's empty, the screen reader and the text browsers, well, the text browsers will display the file name and the screen readers will read the file name. And the file name could be 01234-7910b.jpg, which is completely meaningless. Um, the good thing also about filling out these, this alternative text is you're giving more information to the search engines about what this, this image is. So another example of um, decorative text is when we use it for bullets. I don't need an alt tag for all of these bullets because it doesn't serve any real purpose. It's not communicating any real content. It's just for decorative purposes. Um, a, a common mistake is having redundant information. So for instance, here's a picture of an international student. There's the text for international students. We're going to see the text for international students. We don't also need the photo to say international students. Because what they're going to get is, you know, image link international students, link international students. And so we don't need the screen reader or the text only browser to display or read that more than once. Did I get too technical? No. No? Okay. All right. So in your browser, there is an ability to turn your scripts off. So when you get an opportunity, turn your scripts off. And um, I believe, is it under view, view scripts? Yeah, view scripts, dis disable all scripts. <coughs> and then experience the site. In this particular instance, we're looking at Nike.com. And what I've done is I've rolled over top products, and I get this really nice mega menu. Well, oftentimes, um, people using screen readers or text-only browsers will turn off fancy JavaScript and so forth. And what they get is something like this. And so not only do you have your mega menu, but there was apparently a script that was you know, calling this Flash plugin that I actually did have, but because the script didn't work, it didn't recognize it. And then not only could I not roll over top products, but top products itself was not clickable. And then you'll also notice that my styles changed a little bit on the left hand side. So my navigation up there, I can't even read. So we have a serious color contrast issue. People with vision impairment are not going to be able to see that linked text. Try turning your styles off. So we use um, external styles to control the look and the feel of our websites. There are CSS style sheets you may have heard of. Um, but what happens is, People using assistive technologies 
they'll turn your styles off and they'll, they'll use their own styles, often with really large font and, and whatever uh, font um, they prefer. And so when they turn your styles off, this is what your site looks like. And I like to do this not only to see um, what it looks like with the styles off, but it also gives me a good idea of what it might look like in a text-only browser. So I would have to obviously imagine in my text-only browser, there's only text. So I, I don't actually see the image. So what you want to make sure of is when you do something like this, that your content still flows in a logical order and that your content is all still there, that you can still see it and it is still accessible. And in this case, it is. Um, something that they did um, particularly well when it, uh, what we call degraded, is it also provided links to different areas of the content on this page, which you didn't see when you were um, in the, the regularly styled page. So you can jump all the way down to the navigation, you can jump to the search, you can jump directly to the content, or you can go to the footer, probably to a sitemap for the footer. And here's an example of jumping to the navigation. So that's a plus for Audi. So here's an example of analyzing your color contrast. So you'll notice that I have a map here for, I believe, an underground uh, transit system. And if I have some sort of vision impairment, the color information is no longer valuable, right? I just, I don't see it. This is what I would see. And so this whole image is just rendered useless. Now, I'm not telling you that you can't have these kind of graphics, but if you do, be cognizant of people with vision impairments and give them alternative content. So what would be um, a good supplement to this might be a chart or a table describing the same information that the image does. <sighs> this is a big one. You know, back in the days, we designed our web pages using tables. And I'm not going to go into all of the reasons why you shouldn't use tables to lay out design. But don't do it because it's very difficult for people that are using screen readers and text-only browsers um, to view this information. It's also just bad. It's bad practice. It's old practice. Do not use tables to lay out design. It's not good for search engines. Um, it's not good for having semantically correct uh, code. Um, use tables for data. That's what they were designed for. <clears throat> so when you're creating tables for data, though, it's very important that you structure this appropriately. So when people are using screen readers, if you don't have the appropriate tags for the caption or the table header, um, especially the table header, they can't really navigate or understand what these links are for. So for instance, you can't just put a table that has Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and make it bold, and that's your header. It has to be programmatically correct, so we have to use um, the, the TH tag, the real HTML table header tag that tells our site visitors that that is a table header. And what it allows them to do is when they're using the screen reader, they can get to Tuesday and then they can navigate from Tuesday and see the dates for Tuesday. So they can understand the relationship without it they just see one, two, three, four, five, a bunch of links, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way to 31 or 28 or whatever it is. And they can't understand um, what day it is related to. Um, use the caption tag for your, uh, for your uh, captions instead of just trying to do it with regular uh, headings so that the users also understand that that caption is related to this this set of data. 
Oh, I missed one. Um, well, it was just the summary tag. Um, the summary tag is not viewable to people looking at the site, so sighted visitors can't see it on the screen, but it's in the code. And what the summary does is it provides people um, with information about the table. So summarize the table. If, you, if someone's looking at a complex data chart and you want them to understand you know, or a summary of, of what that chart is trying to convey, do that in a short description in the summary. We won't see it, um, but people using screen readers will. All right, so complex tables, no matter how you slice it, are, are going to be complex. Simple tables are very difficult to read, period. Um, so. My recommendation for complex tables is just to make them simpler. So you'll see here we have you know, two header columns. And here's a simple solution for turning it into one. If you have a table that has you know, two sets of da data, just break it up into two different tables. This is the easiest way to make the tables readable. Um, there are techniques to work with very complex data tables. Um, it's difficult to implement, and it's even more difficult to read. I mean, just because the nature of the, the table and the content itself is, is difficult. Okay, so a couple tools of the trade. And how am I doing with time? Oh, okay. Um, I talked a little bit about Firefox add-ons. They have a web accessibility toolkit. They have the Fangs Reader. They have a bunch of things. So check out Firefox because you can download um, a bunch of add-ons that can help you assess uh, whether or not your site is accessible. There's the JAWS Screen Reader that I talked about. Remember, there's a free uh, demo of that. Um, you can also download a free demo of the, or trial version, sorry, of the Lynx text-only browser. Um, you can sort of simulate that also by, by turning your um, styles off or viewing text only. Um, but the text only browser uh, is a little bit different, so um, check it out. Uh, free automated validators. You're definitely going to want to look at this. Um, there is Wave and Cynthia Says. Uh, but again, they have very limited functionality. I'm going to show you a couple screenshots from both of those pieces. <coughs> Um, but if web accessibility is something that is going to be um, an ongoing effort, it's always best to use a robust suite. And right now, the one who seems to have all the market share in um, accessibility uh, tools is High Software's Compliant Sheriff. And I'll show you a little bit about a little bit of what that looks like. Hmm. That was a duplicate. So this is um, Web Aims Wave. There's the URL wave.wave.webaim.org, and the cool thing about Wave is that it shows you on the screen everything that passes or fails. So, for instance, all of these green things are good. It shows you where you have some of your tags, so you can tell if someone structured something correctly. Um, but here you see um, we have an error. And if you roll over it, it'll tell you what's wrong. And in this particular case, we don't have a heading. There's just no content in the heading. There's also Cynthia says, if you enter your URL, it'll only do like one page at a time. It can check it against section 508. Um, I'm not sure if it does WCAG. No, it does WCAG 1.0, but that's an old standard. So really, if I were to use this, I would probably only use it for Section 508 because the new standard with WCAG is 2.0. Um, when you enter the site, it'll give you a report like this. And actually, these are all of the different sort of guidelines that are listed in the Section 508 guidelines and the WCAG 2.0 standards. 
Now, high software, the, the suite, um, this is not free. Uh, it allows you to scan many web properties at one time. So you don't have to wait to do one URL at a time. This is very helpful if you, know, you have hundreds of pages to scan on a weekly or monthly basis or, day, or even daily basis. And it provides dashboard reporting. So it'll show you the overall health of your site, how people are doing. It'll measure um, how various departments are doing. It'll track your goals. So if you've set certain goals, it'll track whether, whether or how you're progressing along with those goals. Um, it also will show you uh, what some of the errors are um, on the um, actual site the way WebAIM did. And it will also show you a list of the errors the way Cynthia Says did. Um, and it also allows you to customize those checkpoints. So if you want to say, anytime someone enters alt tag that has .jpeg in it, alt, I'm sorry, I said alt tag, alt text that has .jpeg in it, which is a no-no because .jpeg does not describe the content of the image. .jpeg is probably the name of the file. So what you can do is you can say, if someone enters .jpeg or .png or .gif or, or whatever it is, um, .tif, uh, you can tell it fail. Fail, um, fail, fail that al alternative text. Because um, if you don't add it, if you insert alternative text period, you know, the automatic, automated checkers, they don't know what you put in there. They just said, oh, check. You met the requirement. You filled out the alternative text. Only a human or, you know, some sort of customized checkpoint can look out for some of those more common things. So here's what it, sort, here's what it looks like. These are just pieces. Um, so remember I told you it would show you a list of what was wrong. And then it will give you information on how to fix it. It will also show you if this were the um, actual front page of your site, it will highlight it just the way um, the Wave tool did. And it will also give you a glimpse into the source code and, and show you exactly um, where in the source code uh, the error is. And then this is what their dashboard reporting looks like, which is pretty nice. Um, so you can see the top 10 checkpoints top risks, so where you know there are common issues. And this is not this is important stuff because if you see things that are repeating, that means we need to retrain. We need to, you know, get out there and teach people how to make this right. Um, trending, there's nothing here because they're it, it was run for the first time. Oh. <laughs> We're almost over. So I'm hoping that by now, uh, if there was any sort of mystery behind what web accessibility is, I've dispelled any of that. And, and everybody has a good understanding of what's going on in the industry and different things we can do to make our sites accessible. Um, to wrap up, as I said earlier, you know we're using the web for our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, more frequently, sources of information are uh, not available in, un in, in, in any other way but through the web. So it is very, very important that the content that we have on the web is accessible to people using assistive devices and is accessible to people with um, disabilities. Um, so please don't forget who is affected. Um, I did mention that the Department of Justice was considering um, adding the web to the ADA. I did mention that, right? OK. Um, what I probably forgot to mention was that in um, the summer of, of last year, they uh, disclosed um, a, a document stating that you know, they were thinking about doing this and were soliciting feedback. And they made changes to the ADA with new design standards um, in September 
of last year, but they did not include the web, unfortunately. It just affected some um, other standards. Um, but they are still continuing to seek um, public, uh, public uh, comments um, because it is something that they are actively researching and are hoping to resolve by 2012. Okay, so um, please, when you leave here today, if it's not today or tomorrow, you know, relatively soon, try some of the practices that I showed you um, and experience this for yourself so that, you know, we can all be proactive about um, being accessible. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. so Those are that, federal grants, yes. Yeah, so does that count under Section 508 as... Um, mm -hmm, yes. It does, is there a mm -hmm. litigation over that? Over... Over somebody who got NIH or... A or private institution. Yeah. Um, oh, a private... Not to my knowledge. Yeah. Or, you, you know, if you get on um, the, net, the NFB's website, it has an, a whole archive of suits that were filed. And so you can get on, on that site and, and do a little research to find out whether or not um, private institutions were affected. I, I think a litigator is going to take the broadest possible view, uh, which means that because we have Pell Grants and National Science Foundation Grants and every kind of grant you can name, that we do. What extent is an alternative solution considered a viable solution? Just for example, you know. Like yeah, I know what you're asking, and I get asked that all the time. And honestly, I, I don't have um, a solid answer for you because it's a little bit of uh, a gray area. Um, I, I think that um, the common understanding is that if your institution is making efforts to be accessible, then um, you're not as likely to be targeted uh, for litigation. But, I mean, again, I, it, it's gray. Yeah. So is there a site out there now to use as an example and see maybe where this is up uh, I would I would look at webaim.org. Their own site. Uh, yeah, their own site is, pr is pretty accessible, so yes. Mm-hmm, yeah. I haven't found fault in it yet, so. Anything else? Um, well, thank you again for having me over here. Um, thank you. If anyone would like to follow up, I have some business cards up here in the front that you can pick up.
So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks, everybody, for coming.